9 and number 10, you have seen the construction of the CTC panel and learned about some technology working behind the scenes. Today we are having a closer look into the basic configuration of the yellow box. On the technology side, I will discuss some changes to the MQTT gateway, some more details on the touch buttons and the use of web sockets for the CTC panel configuration. Hello YouTubers and welcome to the Internet of Toy Trains. I'm Hans Tanner and here is a new episode of IOTT with fresh ideas about how to use the Internet of Things along with sensors and microcontrollers to control a model railroad layout. So, get on board! The train is leaving the station. The yellow box is becoming a quite powerful device. It can drive a CTC panel with hundreds of LEDs and up to 64 input switches. It can not only display track occupancy and switch positions, but it can also manage routes and track sections either in ABS or CTC control methodology. And it can connect to Loconet directly or to an MQTT gateway via Wi-Fi. While this sounds great, the question becomes how is it possible to configure all these functions properly how to make sure that LED X turns on when block Y gets occupied and how to tell it what color and brightness should be used and hundreds of more options to choose from. And finally, how to teach all this to an average user who is not necessarily a computer programmer. Because after all, we primarily want to play with our trains and not spend most of our time with setting up devices that just should do their job. So, the more complex the device is, the more important becomes the question about how to configure it. One of the common ways is using a handheld throttle, as it is the case for most Digitrax devices. This works fine as long as the number of options is relatively limited. But if you ever have configured the options of a BDL-168 or SE8C, you probably wish that there would be an easier way, particularly if you had to make configuration changes after two years of not touching it and your cheat sheet was lost. That's why I chose a different approach for the yellow box. I notice that nowadays pretty much everybody owns a smartphone or at least can have access to one if needed. So I think it is safe to make a smartphone the standard configuration tool for my devices. From a programming point of view, I make sure that the device can work as access point, so no Wi-Fi is needed, and that all configuration options can be accessed using a web page, so that no app has to be installed on the smartphone. Let me demonstrate how this works. Since I am taking a video, I am showing this from a PC, but it is the same on a smartphone, just smaller and not so easy to record on video. In the original state, the yellow box is programmed to expose a Wi-Fi access point called yellow box with a password of IOTT Cloud. So the first step is to find this access point in the Wi-Fi network list and connect to it. This will then automatically load the configuration page and display it on your screen. Well, not right now. I am still having some stability issues with the so-called captive portal. So for the moment, we need to open the browser and point it to the default address 192.168.25.1 to load the configuration page. Yes, a little annoying, but working. The first page that comes up is the device setup. The first option there is to connect the yellow box to your Wi-Fi network. This is necessary if you want to use the yellow box as Loconet to MQTT gateway or if you would like to access the yellow box via Wi-Fi from any other computer in your network. In the Net Bias Name field, you can enter a meaningful name for the yellow box. If you have several devices, this should be a unique name for each device. Click DHCP if you want it to get an IP address from your router. Alternatively, you can click Static and specify a static IP along with NetMask, Gateway and DNS addresses depending on your router setup. Personally, I prefer having static addresses for my small devices, but I configure them as DHCP and set the address as static in my router setup. 
This has the big advantage that I can control all my addresses from the router and can change them if needed without connecting to all devices individually. If you have activated the Wi-Fi option, you now can click Save and Restart. This will restart the yellow box and it will try to connect to your network, but since you have not entered the network name and password, it will again activate its own access point. Again, connect to it and this time it will automatically go to a captive portal that allows you to select your network and enter your network password. The reason for this two-step approach is that this way your network information is stored in a hidden area of the controller where it cannot be accessed via web browser. If you restart the yellow box again, it will now connect to your Wi-Fi and you can access the configuration page using the assigned IP, either static or DHCP. You can keep the local AP or you can deselect it as you wish. In order to not lock yourself out, it is not possible to deselect Wi-Fi and local AP at the same time. And even if you manage to do so, the yellow box will always start with at least the local AP active. If you want the yellow box to know the real time, you can connect to an internet time server. The advantage is that when you use MQTT messaging, you will get a real timestamp. Otherwise, it will be a date somewhere back in 1970. In the next field, you tell the yellow box where it should be listening for commands and where to send outgoing commands to. Select LocoNet if you use the yellow box as standalone device on your layout. If you don't want to connect the LocoNet cable to the yellow box, but you have a gateway working, you can also connect to the MQTT broker as command source and click Act as Gateway if you want this yellow box providing gateway services. Please note that you should only have one active gateway from LocoNet to MQTT or you may have some very interesting effects of messages being duplicated and going round and round forever, so don't do it. In either way, if MQTT is activated, you need to specify the broker, port, username and password, as well as the broadcast topic and the echo topic. If you watched my video number 3, you know that I used to have two different modes for the gateway, called LocoNet mode and Network mode. In the meantime, I have eliminated the LocoNet mode, so the yellow box only has Network mode. Consequently, there is no out topic anymore, just broadcast. And the echo, of course, so that a device can have confirmation that the message effectively was sent out. For detailed information on message flow in the network scenario, please watch video number 3 and some technical explanations in the next section of this video. When done, click Save and Restart again to restart the yellow box and load the new settings. When it comes up again, you are ready to do all the other settings like setting up block detectors, switches, selecting the colors of each LED and so on. I will cover this in the next video in detail. For now, I'd rather like to give you an update on some technical issues to give you a better understanding of the inner workings of the yellow box. The first topic to talk about is changes to the gateway. I already told you that I eliminated the LocoNet mode. After a few months of testing, I came to the conclusion that everything can be done in network mode, so eliminating LocoNet mode made things simpler. But then, when I was developing the Wi-Fi throttle in video number 7, I was running into a problem with LocoNet message timing. Let me explain. LocoNet essentially has two categories of messages, such that are kind of broadcast messages and such that are essentially querying a device and have a response to it. And since LocoNet does not use device addresses, the response must always immediately follow the request. The only exception is when a device needs more time to get all the information for the response. In this case, the device, normally the command station, sends a busy message while it is working so that no other device can access LocoNet before a response is sent out. This works all well as long as it happens in the same physical network. But adding a gateway along with an MQTT broker and several wireless or handheld devices 
increases latency and makes things unpredictable. Let's assume two devices are sending a query command via MQTT at the very same time. The MQTT broker passes the message on to the gateway and the gateway processes the first message. Since it is a message with a response, the gateway remains blocked until the response is received and only then processes the message from the second handheld device. Since we are not sure whether the message from device 1 or device 2 was processed first, we don't know for sure how to assign the responses to each device. Yes, in some cases we could tell from the message content, but not always. So, in order to overcome this problem, I added a request ID to the MQTT message, which can be set by the handheld device. A simple random number will do the trick. The gateway then returns the same ID as response ID in the return message. And the mobile device only needs to compare the two IDs in order to know whether the response is for its own request or something else. Overall, this adds a good bit of stability to the gateway communication. In the last video, I showed you some research about the touch inputs on the ESP32, which apparently triggered quite some interest among my viewers. As I showed you, those touch lines can be used for touch, analog or digital inputs. Originally, I planned to let the user choose the input type in the setup dialog. However, when I was working on it, I thought, hmm, would it actually be possible that the yellow box software would figure out automatically what type of switch it is connected to? So I went back to the lab and did some more research. I changed my sketch in a way that it would read the same input line for five times as touch input, followed by five more reads as an analog input. Then I calculate the average values for both scenarios. Looking over the data, I found an interesting pattern. Whenever the line was connected to a voltage between ground and VCC, the touch input would return a very low value, typically 0, 1 or 2, but never higher than 5. And the analog read command of the same line would then give a value proportional to the voltage and because it is an 12-bit ADC, that would be from 0 to 4095. If the input is left open, the analog read would return 4095 because of the input pull-up setting and the touch read would return the values reported in video number 10 around 16 to 20 when open and around 8 to 10 when touched. So, with this knowledge, I rewrote my reading routine to decide on the input type and then trigger input events accordingly. In this setup you see 16 input lines from the MOOCs feeding through the ESP32 into 16 LEDs. Digital input and touch input is represented by blue LED for open and red for clicked. If an analog input is detected, the LED shows green with the brightness a function of the analog value. I can now randomly connect the digital switch and a potentiometer to one of the 16 input lines restores the ESP32 and it will display according to what is connected to the input lines. What this means is that the user of the yellow box does not have to spend time to set up the input type for each line, but the yellow box does this now automatically. As always, I have uploaded my sketch to the GitHub page so you can download and play for yourself. The final new technology for me that I started to use for the configuration screen of the yellow box is web sockets. If you watched video number 3, you know that already for the configuration of the original MQTT gateway, I used asynchronous web communication. In that case, it was Ajax, which is the name of a famous soccer team in the Netherlands, but here it stands for asynchronous JavaScript and XML. This technology allows for loading of information from a web server without reloading the entire page and it was developed in 2005. WebSockets, in a nutshell, is a higher level version of the same and became available in 2012. You find some links to more information about WebSockets in the description below. The main difference to Ajax is that it keeps the communication channel open all the time and it allows for true bidirectional communication. 
which means the ESP32 can actually push data to the web browser and it can be displayed in real time. Let me give you an example here as a small appetizer for what I plan to do. As you know, the yellow box can support 64 input buttons, but an average application is probably not using all of them. So when configuring the inputs, the operator would have to know which buttons actually are used. Using WebSockets, I can have the yellow box sending a message whenever a button is touched or pressed and then the browser display the setup line for this very button. The same of course goes for block detector inputs or switches. Just drive a locomotive or the layout and the list of all input sensors will appear on screen. You can then specify what LEDs should lit up if the block is occupied and when you press the show me button they will show on the CTC panel in the specified color. I think you can begin to see the potential this technology offers for all kind of setup wizards for the yellow box configuration. So let me summarize as this was a lot of information. The yellow box is becoming a quite powerful and flexible device that can be configured to a wide variety of different requirements. However, this makes configuration very complex and the display based user dialog is almost a must. Luckily, most users of all ages nowadays carry such a display equipped device. Therefore, it makes sense to use a smartphone and a wireless connection to support device configuration. How this can work, we have seen so far with the example of the general device configuration dialog which follows a structured approach as seen on many IoT devices that are connected to a smartphone and or Wi-Fi. Another approach to reduce configuration complexity is making the devices smarter. We have seen one possibility in the form of smart input lines that can configure themselves depending on the type of switch they are connected to. A good configuration screen also should use some wizard technology to do the work for the user, but this requires ongoing communication between the configuration dialog and the device to update and display user input. The use of web sockets is therefore almost a must, as they allow for continuous bidirectional communication between the device and the web browser. I am working hard now to apply these learning points in the development of the web app for the yellow box configuration, and I hope I will be able to show you some significant progress in the next video. If you want to be first to see the results, please subscribe to the IOTT channel. I hope this video was useful or at least interesting for you. If true, please use the like button below to let me know. Thanks for watching and see you next time.